When an iceberg tore a 350-foot gash in the hull of the Titanic, she went down in less than three hours. But was there more to the disaster than meets the eye? There's something about the story that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Was it an accident or was it a crime? They were businessmen and they would make money by hook or by crook. Is the ship at the bottom of the Atlantic really the Titanic? Almost a century after it sank, the Titanic continues to fascinate us. Exhibitions of items lifted from the wreck, like this one in Manchester, attract tens of thousands of visitors. But now a new theory has emerged, which could turn everything we think we know about the disaster on its head. And if it's true, it would mean that none of the items on display here even came from the Titanic at all. There is something strange going on. And the more you look at it, the more convinced you become that there is, at least, we, maybe we don't know quite what at the moment. We don't know quite what yet in the story, but there's something very, very strange going on. There was no attempt made at all to save that ship. It was almost as if they wanted it to go to the bottom. Could it be that the Titanic was switched with its sister ship, the Olympic, and that it was the Olympic which was sunk deliberately as part of the greatest insurance scam in history? Olympic becomes the Titanic, the Titanic becomes the Olympic. This is the most common form of marine fraud, even today. The Olympic had been badly damaged in an accident. Was an insurance fraud the only way for the owners to get their money back? What we're looking at, basically, is two ships which are exactly the same. To the average person in the street looking at them from a distance, they would simply have no idea which ship was which. Our story begins on the other side of the world, in Brisbane, Australia. And it begins with a tale told by a dying seaman called Paddy Fenton, known to everyone as Paddy the Pig. He's a hard old man, you know, like he's one of the last windjammer seamen, yeah. Paddy, um, told me like he was the uh, ordinary seaman on the Titanic and that uh, the iceberg did not uh, cause the sinking of the ship and that there. What he said it was that um, they had had a fire in the bunkers and that the fire had been burning since uh, they loaded the bunkers. Paddy's claim was bizarre and extraordinary. He said that as ice cold water rushed in, it reacted with a bunker fire in the bowels of the ship to cause an explosion. It was this rather than the initial collision with the iceberg, which sank Titanic. But Paddy had a second, even more astonishing claim. Paddy Fenton did say that there were rumours among the crew that uh, the ships had been switched, there was an insurance scam going on. The logic was this. The Olympic was unusable and uninsurable because of its accident the year before. But if the ships were switched and insurers thought it was the Titanic which had sunk, then they'd be happy to pay up in full. With the insurance scam, Paddy uh, said that it was a big uh, cover-up because when they got back to port, the um, a company official came down with a man from the British government out there, took the crew aside and uh, swore them all to secrecy under the uh, Official Secrecy Act. I think the only reason um, Paddy uh, was telling me is because he was getting old out there and I think he just wanted to clear his conscience. The thing that haunted him the most was um, the women and children, their screams. Paddy's story seemed outlandish, absurd even, as you might expect from somebody who walks around calling himself Paddy the Pig. But then, in 1985, came a discovery which would transform the study of the Titanic. On September the 1st that year, at 12.50 a.m., an American submersible in the North Atlantic began picking up strange images on its underwater cameras. 
Within minutes, the crew realized they'd made the greatest underwater discovery of the 20th century, the wreck of the Titanic. It lay two and a half miles down and was broken into three pieces. And there, in the side of the ship, was a hole, just where Paddy the pig said it would be. The plating is pushed outwards. It's not where something's hit the, sh hit the ship. If it was iceberg damage, when the ship had struck something solid, the plating would have been pushed into the ship, not outwards. The thing with Paddy the pig is that you, unless you knew that that was true, you couldn't have made that up. There is no way that, that Fenton could have known unless he was on the ship and saw an explosion. Perhaps Paddy wasn't mad after all. Could his story actually be true? I decided to head off to the scene of the crime. I'm standing at the Harland and Wolf shipyard in Belfast, and it's on this exact spot that the Titanic and its sister ship, the Olympic, were built. Now, conspiracy theorists claim that the two ships were switched as part of a massive insurance scam. And if it's true, then the switch would have happened right here. The two ships were built side by side on giant gantries. They towered over the city. The Olympic was the older of the sisters, launched a full year before the Titanic in 1911. The class leader of these ships was in fact Olympic. Very, very famous ship in her time, the biggest ship in the world, the, the largest man-made moving object on Earth, all the rest of it. That was all applied to Olympic. Titanic was the second of the class. John Parkinson's father worked as a carpenter on both ships, and John is perhaps the last man alive to have seen the Titanic. Oh, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. See, I was just a wee boy, between five and six years of age when I saw it. My father brought me down here on a Sunday afternoon, and he took me round to see it. There it was when I looked at it. I was afraid in case it would fall on me. It was so big, it seemed to reach the sky. And what did the Olympic look like? Oh, it was a lovely ship too. You'd hardly have known the difference between the two. They were sisters, you see. Eh? Very like each other. Then John told me something that intrigued me. Oh yes, there were rumours that uh, the ships have been switched and all sorts of things. And so this theory's been around for a very long time? It has, yes. It Do you has. remember anyone saying it to you back in the old days? Oh, yes. You, 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 you hear wee bits of rumours about that, you know. But that was a lot of nonsense. It was the Titanic. It was clear the conspiracy theory was as old as the disaster itself. And although John was dismissive, I was curious. I wondered what secrets might lie hidden in Belfast. If you can call land up there, Sean. Jerry Anderson has his finger on the pulse of Northern Ireland. If I wanted to reach the people of Belfast, I knew he was my man. Earlier on today, I mentioned the fact we're going to be talking about Titanic. I've got two gentlemen with me who are from a station, a TV station that is not the BBC, and they're making a programme about the Titanic. What's the crack? Well, it's basically about Titanic conspiracy theories, and there's one main theory we're looking at, and that is that the Titanic wasn't the Titanic at all. Right. Now, you're looking at me like I might be a bit odd. Well, I know you're, you look a bit odd, but <laughs> that's neither here nor there. I promise you there's more to it. Essentially, um, the Titanic, and I'm sure many of your listeners are aware of this, um, had a sister ship called the Olympic. Um, and the people in charge um, came up with a plan, and that was to swap the Olympic with the Titanic. All right, so the ideal thing for you would be if someone rang this programme today and said, listen, funny enough, I remember my grandfather coming into me and saying, do you know what happened that last night? I came out to work for the Titanic, and it was a different ship. Exactly, yeah, now that would be absolutely perfect. You know, I'm not pinning my hopes on it. Absolutely. Someone on the line here already, I don't know who it is. Jim, good morning, Jim. Good morning. Yes, Jim, have you any connection with the Titanic at all? Uh, my partner's grandfather actually worked and built the Titanic. Basically, it wasn't Titanic, it sunk. It wasn't, did you say? Yep. Wow, how do you know that? It's the Olympic, it sank. He swore on his sister ship. Are you serious? Yep. 
the White Star Line, there were financial difficulties, and uh, that's the only way they could claim and get themselves back on track. I mean, that seems to go with what I've been hearing. I was hearing that the, you know, the, the White Star had had some financial difficulties, especially um, with the Olympic, so they couldn't get any insurance money for the Olympic, so that's when the swap took place. Does that kind of fit with what...? Yes, it does. Right. This was becoming more intriguing by the minute. Jack Johnson wanted to get on board. Captain, he says, I ain't holding no coal. Fancy, Titanic, fancy well. If the Titanic and the Olympic were switched, then the trail of events which led to the disaster began here, in Southampton, on September 20th, 1911, with a collision between the Olympic and the Royal Navy cruiser, HMS Hawk. The problem White Star had with the Olympic, uh, the Olympic kept hitting things. The Olympic is pulling out of some Southampton. It's on its way to America. And HMS Hawk is a faster ship. It's passing on the starboard side, on the right-hand side. The two ships found themselves on a converging course, and neither was able to take evasive action fast enough. The Hawk was a vintage 19th century battleship, which was fitted with an underwater ram. And this thing was there, actually, to, to do as much damage as possible to any other ship she managed to, to ram in the side. The Hawk cut a, an enormous double hole in the side of the Olympic, the ram below the waterline and the bow above the waterline. Nasty. And if you think the Olympic looked bad, you should see the Hawk. Everybody on board felt the impact. Glasses were knocked off tables. People were knocked off their feet. They slapped together a makeshift repair in Southampton. But it wasn't till the Olympic had limped back to dry dock in Belfast that the full scale of the damage from the Hawk's underwater ram became clear. When she got back to Belfast, this repair that had taken a fortnight at Island and Wolf's Southampton Yard had failed. What this tells us is that for the back end to flood and these, for these steel plates beneath the water line to have been moved, the hull has to flex to tear the rivets out. Where the hull is flexing at that point, there can only be one reason. The ship's back's broken. Effectively a death sentence for the ship. Harlan and Wolfe has always denied the damage was on this scale. But this diagram, only recently released by the firm, shows hull plating had to be replaced along the entire length of the ship. Not just in the stern where the hawk had struck. Strange enough, the forward end of that diagram almost exactly duplicates the supposed damage to Titanic. Damage that supposedly sank Titanic on the night of April 15. It's a coincidence, um, and I don't like coincidences. Quite possibly, yes, quite possibly that was a weak spot on the hull. Was the Olympic a write-off? The ship they got was, was, was just a couple hundred thousand pounds worth of scrap iron. Was the White Star Line about to go down the tubes? Something has to be done. These men are desperate. Could they really have been prepared to contemplate the drastic solution Paddy the Pig claimed? To switch, then sink, their own flagship? A dying seaman had told an apparently far-fetched story that the Titanic had been swapped with her damaged sister ship, the Olympic. But the Olympic had been damaged in a collision the previous year with the Royal Navy cruiser HMS Hawk, perhaps more badly than the company acknowledged. All of a sudden they've shelled out all this money on a ship which is now useless. It's never going to pass another Board of Trade inspection. And to make matters worse, they'd get no insurance payout. The Royal Navy had investigated the Hawk accident and found itself not guilty. Steamliners were a multi-million dollar business. They catered not just for the rich and the famous, but also for the hundreds of thousands of migrants pouring across the Atlantic to America. Olympic and Titanic are, in fact, the White Star Line's survival strategy in the very, very competitive North Atlantic trade. 
company could well go into receivership. Something has to be done. These men are desperate. The Titanic's ultimate owner was the American J.P. Morgan, one of the most ruthless financiers of the age. The head of White Star was Bruce Ismay, an equally shrewd operator. They were businessmen, and they would make money by hook or by crook. They knew they were in trouble. It may have been at this point that someone in the company came up with a bright idea. Why not take the exact copy of the ship sitting only two or three hundred feet away? We have a lame duck. We have a boat that's no good. So we swap it over with the other boat. Their only way out, really, was an insurance fraud. Otherwise, the ship they got was, was, was just a couple hundred thousand pounds worth of scrap iron. Even today, the most common form of marine fraud is to swap the names of the ships. It goes on all the time. And in those days, it was no different. By staging an accident, they could then claim the full insurance on the Olympic. And the Titanic, masquerading as the Olympic, could sail around the world for the next few decades, earning money for White Star. Here is a perfect opportunity to make good on their losses, make good on the insurance, and uh, develop this whole fraud that no one, they hope, is going to spot. It was brilliant in its simplicity. But if White Star were gonna get away with it, first they'd have to make sure these two ships really did look identical. Bruce Beveridge is a former Chicago cop, a Titanic enthusiast, and a skeptic about the switch theory. He spent years poring over plans and pictures of the two ships, applying his detective skills to the mystery. The small differences between these two ships were minute, and you really had to have a sharp eye in order to pick them out. Bruce looked at photos taken in the months before the disaster and was surprised by what he saw. I found that when I started to compare the photographs of the two ships up until April 1st of 1912, that the Olympic surprisingly was starting to look more and more like Titanic. What should be a case against a switch, uh, we find that the pictures actually start to promote it after a while. For Bruce, the most dramatic example was the portholes. The Titanic had a distinctive five porthole arrangement on the forecastle deck. This feature was missing on the Olympic at the time of its launch. But then, at some point in the winter of 1911, it was suddenly changed to exactly the same pattern as the Titanic. The reason for this, we don't know. But for some reason, the Olympics started to look more and more like Titanic. But should be evidence to disprove a switch theory, in fact, supports it. The sisters were becoming twins. By the spring of 1912, the two ships were almost a perfect mirror image. The plan was primed and ready to go. In March, the Olympic was brought into the dry dock in Belfast to have a propeller blade replaced. It was a job that should have taken two days, but the Olympic was here for one week. It was at this point that many believe the switch was made. There was only one dry dock that could handle ships of this size. They were racing to complete the Titanic. Only one dry dock. The ships were changing places perhaps on a daily basis for about four days, March the 2nd onwards, and uh, that's it. That, that was your opportunity. The switch would have been very simple and very quick. What needs to be changed? A few lifeboats, a few life belts, a few letterheads and menus? Basically, trivial stuff. I mean, White Star actually made a practice of making all their, their portable items interchangeable ship to ship. Both ships are used exactly the same stuff. And the crest on all this was not the name of the individual ship. It was uh, the White Star Line. So that was taken care of. When the rest of the workforce comes back into work on Monday morning, it's like nothing's happened. If true, it was the greatest sleight of hand in history. On March the 7th, the ship White Star called the Olympic sailed out of Belfast. Three weeks later, the ship they called the Titanic was ready for its maiden voyage. But White Star had one last hurdle to overcome, Titanic's official sea trials. Normally these things have two days of sea trials, 
to full days. Sea trials. Normally these things have two days of sea trials. Two full days of sea trials. Uh, Titanic only got the benefit of one short day. It was never run up to full speed or, or put through any uh, serious manoeuvres at all. The trials were so superficial, the inspectors failed to notice one fact in particular. The Titanic was on fire, just as Paddy the Pig had said. It is an established fact that there had been a coal bunker uh, fire uh, burning. Uh, it had been burning from the time the ship actually left Belfast. I mean, that wasn't known back in the 60s, well, not widely known. It was only people like, uh, well, people like me that, that dig into these things all the time. Quite extraordinary, this. You can't help being amazed by the slapdash nature of some of the things that went on. There's one thing that sailors fear more than anything else at sea, more than icebergs, more than sea monsters, it's a fire. But of course, as far as the inspectors were concerned, they were looking at a brand new ship, and they weren't bothered to look too closely. They've seen the plans, they know the thing works, it's exactly the same build as the Olympics, so we can sign it off at 12 o'clock and all go for an early lunch. The inspector didn't even go down to the engine room to have a look. White Star had got away with it. With their certificate of seaworthiness in their pocket, and with the fire merrily raging in the bunker, they took the Titanic down to Southampton. But there, further troubles awaited them. The crew signed on in Belfast seemed to have taken a dislike to the new ship. We know that, that the crew that brought the ship down from Belfast, only one of those men actually signed back on. The boilermen and stokers resigned en masse. A bunker fire was bad enough, but was there something else about the ship which worried them? As the first crew to, to actually work the ship, they would have noticed almost immediately that the coal bunkers, that the, well, the, the furnaces on the, on the boilers, were not new. They didn't want to know about this ship. Perhaps Paddy the Pig was right when he said there were rumours amongst the crew of a switch. Their decision not to sign back on is all the more surprising, given that Britain was in the grip of a national coal strike. Literally thousands of seamen were out of a job because the coal strike ships were just laid idle. There was no coal to get them to sea. Thousands of, of sailors are without work, and yet these men choose to throw themselves out of a job. And the greasers down below were not the only ones reluctant to board the Titanic on its maiden voyage. If you look at the uh, records, 55, mainly first-class passengers, have also cancelled their voyage. The strangest cancellation of all was the ship's owner, the financier J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan, he had promised publicly to go on the maiden voyage, but he cancelled at the last minute on grounds of ill health. And shortly afterwards, the New York Times reporter ran him to earth in the south of France, where he was extremely healthily uh, diverting himself with his mistress. When Titanic finally set sail from Southampton on April the 10th, it's a little known fact that she was just two thirds full. The plan, it's argued, was to scuttle her in mid-Atlantic, but the company had one minor problem. She was full of people. The captain, E.J. Smith, would need to be in on the plot. And there were various White Star officials on board, including the ship's designer, Thomas Andrews. They'd need a rescue vessel. Enter Stanley Lord, captain of the passenger cargo ship, Californian. The whole of California's performance makes me think that uh, she was a major part of the plan to, to get the people off Titanic before sinking it. The Californian was also owned by J.P. Morgan, until a few days before it had been stuck in the port of London because of the coal strike. Suddenly, mysteriously, there's enough coal for Californian, and the orders to sail are obviously sail ASAP as soon as you possibly can, because you've got to get somewhere. Her sudden departure was all the more mysterious because she was virtually empty. Captain Lord has taken the Californian into the mid-Atlantic with no passengers and no cargo, except for 3,000 woolen sweaters and blankets. Exactly what you'd need if you were going to turn your ship into a glorified lifeboat. 
the Californian sailed at full speed across the Atlantic before suddenly coming to a halt on the evening of April 14th. Captain Lord orders Californian stopped. The boy rush half across the Atlantic just to stop. Was the Californian keeping a rendezvous? She'd received ice warnings, but no other ship in the North Atlantic felt obliged to stop that night, certainly not the Titanic, which at that very moment was careering at full speed towards almost exactly the same point. Captain Smith had ice warnings for most of the day. He was well aware that there was ice ahead. He never slowed down. He didn't put extra lookouts at the, at the head of the ship. He only had them in the crow's nest. But this was business as usual. Time is money on these ships. Collisions with icebergs were incredibly rare, even at night. I mean, normally you can see the thing, you know. <laughs> you would steer around it. But of all nights, White Star had picked the night of April 14th, 1912, to stage its accident. A night of freak conditions that would not be repeated for many years. It was a cold, clear, starlit night with no moon. So visibility, although you could see the stars, visibility was practically zero. It was also unusually calm, as portrayed in this rarely seen 1929 film of the disaster. This was the calmest night on the North Atlantic in decades. Absolutely no movement at all. There's no waves breaking against the base of the iceberg, which was the common giveaway the uh, lookouts were always able to see that the white water, it, it, the splashing against the icebergs. The final fatal piece in the jigsaw was the presence in the area of a rare phenomenon, black icebergs. Icebergs roll over as they melt, then perhaps the shape changes uh, underneath and they, they, they roll over. And when they do that, the newly exposed side may be virtually black. At 11.40 p.m., an enormous black iceberg blotted out the horizon directly ahead of the Titanic. Obstruction ahead, sir! On The Titanic swerved to the left, but it was too late. The iceberg tore a 350-foot gash in the ship's hull. The Titanic was divided up into 16 watertight compartments. Now, any two of those could flood and she'd be okay. But the iceberg sliced through the first five compartments. Thomas Andrews, the ship's designer, took one look at the damage and knew the Titanic was doomed. Well, the Titanic hit the iceberg at just the right angle to cause just enough damage and just enough watertight compartments to cause her to sink. This was unheard of. If Captain Smith had been trying to stage an accident, he'd now suffered a real freak accident. He appeared shocked and stunned. Here we have a situation where it all starts to go wrong. The best laid plans of mice and men. That early period after the collision, the, the senior officers froze that they didn't do any of the things they should have done. The first SOS didn't go out for 35 minutes. 35 minutes, that's a, a quarter of the time it took for the ship actually to sink. No SOS. And an hour and 25 minutes after the collision, that is when the first lifeboat is launched. When lifeboats were finally launched, for some inexplicable reason, many weren't full, despite the fact Titanic only had enough lifeboats for half the people on board. Now, there's only one explanation for this, and that is that they are expecting some sort of uh, rescue operation to materialise in the next few minutes. Smith may have been expecting the lifeboats to unload people onto the Californian and then return. But in swerving to avoid the iceberg, the Titanic had moved out of sight of Captain Lord's ship, which now sat just over the horizon. We could hear all the panic of the people on the decks rushing about looking for lifeboats, and all the lifeboats were gone. And there were still 1,500-odd people left on board. We saw the Titanic sink, which was a terrifying sight, and we heard all these people in the water screaming, which was, I think, perhaps the worst thing of all. 
By the morning, when survivors were picked up, 1,500 people were dead. Titanic was sinking down, they had them life boats around. Bandy, Titanic, Bandy well. When the Titanic was sinking down, they had them life boats around. Bandy, Titanic, Bandy well. My father heard the sweet newspaper boy shouting outside. Tilly special, Tilly special, and the stark words on it, Titanic sunk. My dad, big strong man he was, he worked in the shipyard all his life. He just broke down and he cried like a child. What had started here in Belfast as one of the greatest scams in history had ended in fiasco. If the truth had come out, it would certainly have been a bit embarrassing for the political establishment. As the traumatised crew arrived back in England a month later, it appears they were being closely watched. More than 700 of the 900 people employed on the Titanic had died, but for the survivors, the ordeal was not yet over. When the crew gets back to Plymouth, instead of being reunited with their wives and sweethearts, which is what everybody expected, they're held for 24 hours in this damp railway shed and then they're visited by a very high up official from the White Star Line and somebody who they believe to be uh, somebody very high up in the government. There's no doubt about it. That basically the right act was, was read to these blokes, do not talk to the press, do not talk to other people about it. For some reason these rarely seen mugshots were taken of each and every surviving member of the crew. Was this the intimidation Paddy the Pig had mentioned in his story? There's something about the story that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Unless you look at it in the terms that there was actually a cover-up. Either Paddy Fenton was on the Titanic, or he'd been very close to somebody that was. One after the other, Paddy's claims had been shown to have at least a basis of truth. Paddy the Pig's story may have sounded like the slightly odd ramblings of an elaborately named sailor, but it proved remarkably accurate. But then, in 1998, a new piece of evidence emerged from the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. A 17-ton piece of the wreck which appeared to blow a hole in the entire switch theory. A group of Titanic experts had built a powerful argument that Titanic had been switched with its sister ship, the Olympic, before the famous disaster. But back in Northern Ireland, I wanted to see if the theory really held water. For almost a hundred years, this was the main headquarters of the Harland and Wolf shipbuilders in Belfast. And this was the main drawing room. It was in this room that plans for both the Olympic and the Titanic were drawn up. I've come here to meet with someone who may have evidence which blows the whole switch theory out of the water. You all right? Hello. How are you doing? Yeah, David Lawrence. Nice to meet you. I'm Danny. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. This is a great room. Isn't it? For over 40 years, David Livingstone was one of the top well, naval architects at Harland & Wolf. In 1998, he took part in a dive down to the wreck. We landed in the debris field, and it was very amazing to see all the things that had fallen out of the ship. And my first view of the ship was the bar rising out of the doom. Of course, that's the most beautiful part of Titanic and the most well recognized. During the dive, the largest piece ever raised from the Titanic was brought to the surface, a 17-ton chunk of hull. David was asked to identify it. There were two large uh, portholes and two small ones. And we thought initially that this would be a very easy way of identifying where it came from. He looked first at the original master plans. 
plans which were drawn up for both the Titanic and the Olympic. But to his surprise, the pattern of portholes on the hull piece was nowhere to be seen. But then David ordered up a separate set of plans, plans which were done just for the Titanic. This is uh, sp the specific plan for Titanic. It's uh, uh, ship number 401. And we can see here that the two small portholes are actually shown on this drawing. So this is specific to Titanic. The Titanic plans matched the wreck. It turns out an extra toilet had been added, meaning an extra porthole had to be drilled. A porthole which never appeared on the Olympic. And then it all fitted into place. Now, is it in any way possible that you were mistaken that day and that you weren't looking at the Titanic at all, that you were looking at the Olympic? <sighs> Absolutely not. This, of course, is a section of the biggest piece of the Titanic that's ever been recovered, and uh, it's a real favourite of mine, of course, because you can see those wonderful overlapping steel plates and some of the two... Robin Gardner is the high priest of Titanic conspiracy theorists. A former plasterer from Oxford, he's now writing his third book on the subject. A film set, this is the real thing. That's right. I took him to Manchester to meet with Mark Lack, head of the Titanic exhibition. This is actually, Robin, as you know, the uh, recovery of the big piece, yeah. the largest piece yeah. of the Titanic that's ever been recovered. And of course, I got uh, Mark to show Robin the new evidence. But what's unique, of course, are these very two small portholes that are in the center, the smallest portholes yeah. that only show up on the deck plan or the, the plans of the Titanic. Yeah. But Robin wasn't fooled that easily. Obviously, Harland and Wolf would have spotted this almost immediately and and converted the second ship to, to have the correct um, number of portholes. It's no great difficulty for, for shipbuilders of the calibre of Harland and Wolf. The wreck was still the Olympic, he believed. The extra porthole had simply been added following the switch to make it look like the Titanic. Was, there was no problem in, in altering anything on these ships as far as Harlands were concerned. I mean, basically they used 30 foot long pieces of six feet wide inch thick steel, like a, a child plays with Meccano. But the wreck was yielding other uncomfortable surprises for the conspiracy theorists. On the starboard propeller blade, the number 401 was clearly visible. Titanic's ship number. In, in the foundry where those things were cast, and they were cast right at Harlan the Wolf, they marked those blades so that they could identify which ship they belonged to so that they would not get mixed up. But again, there may be an explanation. In October 1911, when the Olympic returned to Belfast following the Hawk collision, she had to have her propellers replaced. Is it possible they simply took the propeller from the still unfinished Titanic? The damaged propeller of the Olympic is now useless. So they remove that, they take the starboard propeller from the Titanic and put it on the Olympic. Now, if they did do that, then everything gets a bit confusing. So the ship that's on the bottom, if that's Titanic, then obviously the wrong propeller was obviously fitted to Titanic in the to Olympic in the first place. Has to be, doesn't it? Say that again now. I'm sorry. But let's I didn't let's quite work through it. No, I don't think I follow me through <laughs> <laughs> And if these two are confused, how am I meant to keep up? But could you really just have stuck Titanic's propeller on the Olympic? Bruce Beveridge doesn't think so. Propellers for ships are not exactly alike. The whole reason why they put the 401 on it in the first place is so that they knew in the yard that this propeller was meant for the Titanic. I mean, if they were interchangeable with the Olympic, then they, there would be no reason for that. You could just go into the shed and say, give me one of the big ones in the back. And the propeller isn't the only item which was marked. This cabinet was found floating in the water at the wreck site shortly after the disaster. On the back, 401 is clearly visible. And there are numerous others with the 401 stamp. I think we found about six pieces, six pieces. Uh, that it was, it was an obvious uh, stamping or numbering. But again, uh, Robin's not convinced. Of course, these things would have come, been parked in the stores at Harlands. The man goes to the stores to get, for the sake of argument, um, a stand for a, for a telegraph. Mm -hmm. Pick up the first one he comes to. Yeah. Now, it's interesting. The official number for the Olympic was... Yeah. What, 400? 400, right. Yeah, yeah, we have never found anything at the wreck site that has 400 on it's it. It's the old trick. If you're not looking, you won't find it. It's, um, that, that's... But I think if we would have spotted 400, it would have caught our eye, of course. Well, good. I'd like to... Right? Yeah. I'd I'll give you a ring when we do. Well, thank you. That's <laughs> <all>. <laughs>
Bruce Beveridge's obsessive... <laughs> Bruce Beveridge's obsessive study of photographs was also beginning to yield results. He'd found that although the two ships may have looked similar from the outside, on the inside there were a number of minor differences. There's too many minute changes, whether it be a light on a bulkhead that was placed one frame to the right or one frame to the left. You know, these are things that people who pay real close attention to these two ships and these photographs can notice. The wheelhouse was just one example. We have the wheelhouse of the Olympic. Originally, her wheelhouse had a curved front. On Titanic, the wheelhouse had a straight front. On the wreck today, the ship's wheel is the main attraction for visiting submersibles. Plaques have been left along the base of what was once the wheelhouse wall. As this photo shows, that wall was clearly straight, as on the Titanic. The evidence is there in the photographs. The differences that are on the Titanic from the Olympic can be verified through the wreck. Anything that is still left that were specific to Titanic on the wreck are still there. And back at Radio Foil, the trail was turning cold as well. Okay. Yes, who's that? Roy, Roy Anderson. Yes, hello, how are you, sir? What, uh, what have you got to add to our story? Oh, right. Uh, first of all, well, my grandfather and my wife's grandfather were both cabinet makers on the Titanic. My grandfather and my wife's grandfather never, ever talked about the boat being changed or switched. And they were deeply involved with it. Uh, no, it was the Titanic that went down. Eh, hey, right. Right, uh, nice, thank you. The plot thickens. Okay, good luck. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sammy's on three. Good morning, Sammy. Jerry, it was the Titanic that definitely sunk. Yeah. Jerry, it's typical of Irish myth and legend. <laughs> that, that's, all, that's something we haven't mentioned, Irish myth and legend. Exactly, the story, the story gets better every time I tell it. This didn't really make sense to me. If the two ships were switched, you'd expect to hear something more than the occasional half-baked rumour. Jerry agreed. I don't think anyone really believes that there was ever a switch. Because when you think about it, the number of people, I don't know if it, what it was, 15,000 people working on the Titanic. I mean, can you imagine trying to keep 15,000 people quiet? and actually keep it under their hat, especially Irish people, after a few pints, it just cannot be done. I was beginning to feel it was time I took a second look at Paddy the Pig, the Irishman who claimed he was an ordinary seaman on the Titanic. I think Paddy the Pig uh, liked to spend a lot of yarn in the pubs. Uh, I think he was getting a lot of free drinks for his stories because uh, he was a complete fraud. This is the crew list for the Titanic, and there's something striking about it. Paddy the Pig's real name, Patrick James Fenton, appears nowhere. James Fenton is nowhere to be found on the survivor lists or on any of the crew sign-on lists. This means that this man didn't get paid. You know, it's one thing to be missing from Rostron's list of survivors or any other official list of survivors. That it happened a couple of times. But to not be on the crew list, that, that is definitely a red flag. That means that the man wasn't there. As for Paddy the Pig's hole in the starboard hull, well, there's another explanation. The simple fact is that the ship actually broke in half, and uh, when the bow section went down, um, she hit the bottom, nose first, and dug herself in, and then bent backwards and that opened up the plating in the area where the reserve coal bunker was. It is just coincidence that it happens to be near the reserve coal bunker. Paddy just got lucky. When the Titanic was sinking down, you had them lifeboats around. Found the Titanic, found you will. So, was the Titanic switched at birth? The experts are divided. I would have to say that the question remains open. I do not have enough concrete information to categorically say that the ship on the bottom of the Atlantic is the Titanic. It's amazing how far you can go with it. It's astonishing um, how easy it was or would have been to make the switch if that's what happened. I think it's utter nonsense. Um, it may be a very good bit of fiction, but it cannot be substantiated in facts. The switch theory, I think, um makes for good reading. I think it can probably make a good movie, but it's, it's a myth and it should remain there. So you reckon it's bunkum? Absolute bunkum. This is a cracking conspiracy theory, and one that's all too tempting to believe, were it not for the vast mass of evidence against it. 
But that's not to say it's absurd, far from it. It's very, very easy to see how this whole thing must have begun. This is the only film ever taken of the Titanic. Only a few dozen photographs exist. After all, she sank within a fortnight of being completed. But after the disaster, there would be an insatiable demand for images. People started churning out souvenirs, it was quite extraordinary. Something like 200 commemorative postcards, and I don't think any of them showed the Titanic. They all showed the Olympic. You say to yourself, which ship am I actually looking at? The newsreels followed suit. These are some of the most frequently used images of the Titanic, except it's really the Olympic. The giveaway? See how the filmmaker has scratched out the harbour name from the back of the tugs. That's because these shots were taken in New York, the city the Titanic never reached. Even to this day, people are still misidentifying photographs. You know, they're saying that it's a Titanic when in fact it's the Olympic. They're, they were 99% identical. So it seems the Titanic and the Olympic never were switched. There never was an insurance scam. But by a twist of fate, it's the Olympic which has sailed into history in a thousand postcards and newsreels. Unless, of course, they were switched, in which case it was the Titanic after all.